Thank you very much for the invitation to present today. I'm going to talk about magnetochiluric as a technique for imaging melt and use some case studies for the main Ethiopian rift and AFAR. In fact, I'm going to start with AFAR uh, and then work down. I should have done it the other way around to uh, be more in line with starting from Rita's field area, but never mind. She's introduced some hugely useful concepts, which I'm going to uh, therefore spend less time on than I might have intended. So I'm going to start with just a really, really brief overview of the MT method, then present results from the field areas, and in particular, try to indicate how um, other data have been used in conjunction with the MT to make sensible conclusions and, and understand a little bit more about what's going on. And I'll try to sum up at the end. So uh, what do we do in magnetochilurics? We record the tiny temporal variations in the magnetic and electric fields. And we measure in orthogonal directions using incredibly sensitive equipment because we are trying to get these very small signatures that are arising from externally driven um, field changes from interactions with the solar wind. Then we have to do lots of data processing and convert finally to frequency domains. So we're doing fast rate of transforms. Uh, and then we look at the ratios of the electric and the magnetic fields as a function of frequency. And those are the data that indicate the subsurface resistivity structure, where period or the inverse of frequency is providing our depth proxy. Uh, we can also look at the structure of these ratios um, of the uh, electric and magnetic fields, and they'll indicate the minimum dimensionality needed to explain our data. And in MT, we use sensitivity tests widely to test the robustness of features and to test whether features are required and, and things like that. So when I mention that later on, those are the kind of studies that um, I'm talking about. So here is the schematic field layout, and you see that we need an area of about 100 metres squared. Uh, we've got, if I get my pointer to work, yep, there we are, uh, magnetic sensors here. These are going to be coils. This is what we use for broadband. If we're doing long period uh, measurements, then we use flux gate magnetometers. And then we measure the electric field by sensing the voltage difference between two between pairs of electrodes. So if we know what the voltage difference is, we divide by the uh, length of the, the light, the separation between the two, and that gives us the electric field. So that's the schematic here it is in, in reality. Um, it's really important to be um, accurate in your uh, setup. So very careful leveling and also very careful orientation of north, south and east, west. So here are magnetic sensors. And this is putting in one of the electrodes. We use um, a bentonite mud typically to make sure that moisture is retained. And if we're doing broadband measurements, we'll leave the equipment out for a few days. If it's long period, then there'll be it will be there for a few weeks. And here's an example of um, real time data uh, using here are the four components that we're recording, the two magnetic ones at the bottom, the two electric ones at the top. This is a two second time scale. And you can see that there are simultaneous bursts of energy in all four components. So these are the signals that we're trying to identify that are telling us about the subsurface structure. And then we do calibration factors, et cetera, et cetera, to give time series in the correct unit. So here are the magnetic field changes and here are the electric field changes over now a much longer time scale. So um, I'm not going to talk anything really about the um, inversion or treatment of the data, but I'll go on to some actual, actual examples. And in 2005, there was a mega dike intrusion in a magnetic segment in the AFAR, which I think we've heard plenty about in previous studies. Um, but uh, led by Cindy Ebbinger, we went to this area and collected MT data. And I'm going to show you results from two profiles. This one is across the northern part, the active magmatic segment at the time when uh, dike intrusions were still taking place, and then an inactive segment further south down here. And you can see that our profiles are roughly parallel to the rift and the data dimensionality did indicate that two dimensional inversion um, should be acceptable. So this is the profile now across the actives, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, across the active segment here from west to east. Um, and here is the actual set, the rift center shown by the uh, red lines on the, um, the map here. Also shown on there is the seismicity um, that 
has been projected five kilometers north and south of the profile, which shows all these um, small seismic events that were um, caused by the magma intrusions. And you'll also see that there, the receiver functions here uh, migrated onto the profile, where you can see a uh, very strong uh, receiver functions here and much weaker ones here where our colors are warmer. And I'll come on to that in, in the next slide. But this is now the best fitting two-dimensional model of resistivity parameterized into blocks. And you can see how the um, resolution of the data changes with depth. We, can have, we need very small blocks near the surface, but they're much, much broader um, at, at depth there. So the cross rift model and interpretation, remember in all of my um, figures, warm colors are low resistivity and that will tend to be hot or molten material or potentially saline filled uh, rich fluids as is interpreted at the surface here. So we have um, the rift axis here I already mentioned before with the seismicity with a known shallow magma chamber. This is known from seismicity from geodesy um, from the samples that we get from um, eruptions. What was less expected was this deep magma reservoir um, that straddles the moho here. Uh, but sensitivity analyses were, were, are unable to tell us whether these two are connected. But the geochemistry indicates that this deep magma chamber is probably not feeding the dikes. And if we compare that with the inactive segment to the south, this color bar is still the same. So you'll see that there's much less of these warmer colors there. So the higher resistivities mean that there's much less magma. But again, we do see evidence for a magma chamber straddling the moho, again, with the attenuation of the re receiver function signals defining the crustal thickness there. Uh, over this um, inactive segment, segment, we also have a gravity model. Uh, here are the gravity data here with the interpretation underneath. And you'll see that there are intrusions of partial melt, relatively high density partial melt with very high density um, solidified basalt above them. And if we project that onto the MT model that I've just shown you, you can see how both of them have evidence for these, this blob of partial melt essentially at, um, at moho depths and also a slight offset from the rift axis in both where more of the, um, the, the magma rich areas are, are to the east of it, whereas they were to the west further north. Uh, there's plenty of seismic evidence confirming this inference of significant amounts of melt in the region, for instance, seismic anisotropy, receiver functions, surface waves, and PN speeds. Um, and the PN speeds in particular are indicating melt at the mantle. At, at the Moho Big Pond. So uh, what we were then able to do was to go on and try and estimate melt volumes. The, the conductivities are very high and suggest lots of melts in the subsurface, but we'd like to know how much is lots. So the way we did this was to relate the bulk conductivity to host and melt resistivities and have uh, some assumptions as to how the melt is arranged. And then we can get melt fractions and hence melt volumes. So how do we work out the melt conductivity? It's strongly dependent on composition and we constrain them using um, eruptive fissure basalt and olivine hosted melt inclusions were, that were collected at the same time as we were doing the MT study. They showed to have a primitive composition with a relatively low water content. Uh, the area I'm not looking at today is over near the Dabahu volcano, which are, where there's rhyolite samples, which are much more evolved. Uh, with help, help ugh, beg your pardon, feldspar hosted melt inclusions and possibly a higher water content. But we can use these data to uh, work out what the bulk conductivity, what the melt conductivity is, and then infer that um, to get the melt percentages. So what we've done here is we've basically simplified our model and looked into areas in white here where we infer eight to 22% melt, the red rim surrounding that is three to eight percent melt, and then the blue is is much lower like that. And this is the deeper off-axis magma chamber I showed you, and there here's the shallower one, more or less directly beneath the rift. And then basically, we from the these areas I just sort of drew simple circles on there, and just assumed that they were defining the melt areas of between eight and twenty-two percent, and between three and eight percent. And this is the case along the active segment. And then, as we saw earlier, there was much less melt along the inactive segment, where we don't exceed the 5% um, 
or so um, melt fraction. And then what we can do, we've got a 2D model. So in, in, in principle, our model extends to infinity um, off the axis of this model. But what we said was, what, what's the sensible interpretation of infinity? Well, it's the length of a magmatic segment. So we assume laterally continuous zones of melt as indicated by this model to infer 370 cubic kilometers of melt in the shallow magma chamber and about 1400 in the deeper one and compared that with the 200 kilometers cubed um, in the magma chamber that we saw in the inactive segment. Um, and this 370 cubic kilometer equates to six kilometer cubed per kilometer of rift, although we do know that the, um, the melt was really only coming from one source and then propagating rather than being continuous along the lift, uh, the rift as might be indicated by the magma chamber. So the implications of this is now. there's enough melt Thanks, enough melt to feed activity at current rates for 400 years, um, but we've got recent diking events only taking place every 400 years or so. We know that we've got 20 millimetres per year far field spreading, so that built, and we need that to build across 200, that's 20 kilometres thick, and hence we've got enough magma for 10,000 years there, which suggests that magma reservoirs are not transient features in the FR region. This has been a subject of some controversy. So very quickly, let's go along now to the northern main Ethiopian rift. And this again was a project that was initiated by Cindy Ebbinger and I see Aftab Khan was, um, was on the, the seminar today and he was another main proponent. So this was um, an NT survey across the same site that we also had seismic and gravity data. Here's the 2D model from Northwest to Southeast. Um, again, showing high conductivity, high conductivity, low resistivity beneath the rift here, where we've got a rift axis conductor. And then uh, we've also got some off axis, very high conductivities, which are um, inferred to be, as I'll show you in a moment, from crustal underplate. So this is the interpretation of this with seismic MT. Here's a gravity model that was taken from the seismic model um, to, to work out where we might, and you can see the intrusion here, the, 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 um, up the underplate here, and then the rift axis itself with the um, high density intrusions. So we're assuming this is solid and then this is still melting. And there's um, some of the seismic evidence for those, that structure uh, along there. And then we also use this model to understand the distribution of lower crustal earthquakes that are taking place beneath um, the depth at which the brittle ductile transition should take place. So we assume that we found that lower crustal earthquakes could be induced by magmatic processes in this warm mafic crust where we've got the highest percentage of partial melt as indicated by the resistivity model. And then very quickly, I'll move on to the southern mainly Ethiopian rift, the more recent um, study that we've done, where we now have got a three distribution of sites and both broadband and, and long period. So here's the area shown in this map here. And there are two volcanic centers uh, shown here, Aluto, which has been very heavily studied, and also the Tulamoya. And they're both actually sites that are being um, either exploited or explored for geothermal um, energy. And here's our 3D model of that. And you can see a very, very good conductor beneath the Tulamoya center, a less well-established one beneath Aluto, but there is um, a plenty of evidence of low resistivities, high conductivities there that would be conducive, uh, con consistent with melt. You also see that there's a very, very strong conductor beneath basically the rift um, edge to the northwest. Again, we've got some geochemistry part uh, partial melt inclusions, so, so we've been able to do some melt fractions, and this is now shown in depth sections, so this is shallow down to the base of the crust. Um, and you can see how we're going to really quite large, um, high percentages of melt in the, in the deep part of the crust. Uh, and we've estimated the total volume here. One thing that it is worth saying is that MT does not have the ability to resolve the distribution of melt in the lower crust. We don't know from our kind of data whether it's concentrated between beneath the volcanic centers, such as centered by uh, suggested by Temtimatel, or more widely distributed, as indicated by Iden and Edmonds. And these were both sort of toy models that they published in the same year. Regularization causes our, um, the melt to be con continuously distributed in our models. Um, 
as I said, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of conductive material, i.e., we're inferring a lot of melt on the uh, what we call the silted debrisite fault zone to the northwest, and also dozens of scoria cones. Um, and we, uh, there's lots of um, either magma storage or slow ascent going on here, as indicated by this model um, in fact from uh, from Rumi et al. in 2007. And this is also consistent. This also coincides with the largest amount of seismic SKS phase splitting, which we to mentioned earlier, anywhere in the, either the northern MER and southern. Afar. So we, the melt there is not concentrated um, in these magmatic segments, primarily um, beneath the rift zone, but seems to be concentrated off to the northwest. And here are some on and off axis conceptual models as published by um, Edmonds in 2020, with these sort of crystal rich mush here in the axis center caldera and high off axis melt flux um, to the side here. And that's been related by them to the um, carbon dioxide emissions that have been also characterized along the way there. So I should finish. Um, conclusions, empty evidence for copious amounts of melt in the MER and FR. Uh, melt resides just in the mantle beneath FR. Uh, where it should be too buoyant to hang around. Distribution in the lower crust in the main Ethiopian rift, uh, either pervasive or just between beneath the volcanic centres, can't be resolved with MT. And we don't have a very clear indication, I think, yet from other methods. Melt volumes can be estimated with the knowledge of composition and laboratory experiments on uh, that should be melt conductivity, not rock con conductivity. And then MT can help determine the processes and time scales associated with rifting. Thank you. Thanks a lot. There's time for a few questions. Uh, Kathy, I did not really understand this off-axis uh, volcanism. What 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 could be the process for for forming this uh, offset zone? You briefly showed a sketch, but uh, there was not much time. I couldn't digest it. Uh, this on here. Are you talking about uh, here, or are you talking about in the AFR? I, I still see the yeah this one yeah exactly in the manifold yeah 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 um it just it just seems to be I, I it's beyond my um ability to to uh, propose what might be causing it um others here may have much better ideas than me but it certainly seems to be the case from the MT um not just from our study previous studies we saw off axis um uh, melt production um further north as well that we think was associated with uh, um underplating of the crust on the Ethiopian plateau side very distinct from the structure of the MT model on the Somalian plateau side um, and, and again, as I mentioned, the seismic evidence from the, the SKS splitting was a very high volumes of melt there. Um, what, why exactly it happens and, and whether this, the composition is different from what we see in the um, axis centre um, where the magmatic segments are, I, I don't know. There's, there are probably other people here who are much able to comment on that than me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ameha, you, you raised your hand first. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I I think probably you answered this question already, but I will ask it anyways. So in in one of your profiles across the active Adoale volcanic complex, you showed that the melt is deflected to the right. Why it happens like this? Why the melt is deflected to the right? Um, let me see if I can get back to you. You're talking about. Um... This one in Aduale in Afar. This is Afar, yeah. This is the inactive segment to the south. So I'm not sure if you meant that. And that's where it's that seems to be where it's slightly off axis to the um east. Uh, I mean, where I, I mean the one across the Aduale volcanic complex, the active segment. Yeah, here. Okay, I beg your pardon. Yes. So yeah, we've got this, this one, deep, yeah. this we've got this really deep, large um uh conductor. Um and I mean, it could be rift axis jumping. So, I mean, if you kept the rift axis constant um, the same place for a long time, you'd really struggle to to not melt the whole thing. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll show if I can get through to it, I'll show you some of this, the geochemistry that 
Um, here we go, yeah. So this is the geochemist viewpoint of that. So we've got um, rapid ascent of magma beneath the rift axis. So it re resides for only a short time in the magma chamber here and then erupts or, or dike, in, uh, sorry, forms the dikes that are intruded along the, the length of the rift there. Whereas we've got much slower ascent through um, the thermal boundary layer here and then the, the magma is able to pond at the magma at the uh, the mo here, so this would be the kind of um, scenario that we would interpret that by. Why it should be off, you know, why it should be um, off axis, and why it should be particularly on the west. I don't know that I've got any very clear um, view about. Okay, thank you. The next question from Aftab Khan, please. I just wanted to ask uh, Kathy. Uh, that was very interesting. I, I haven't seen much, much of these, this work before. Do you know if there's any work going on in Ethiopia by the university or the people in the Ministry of Energy following all this up? That was, I mean, geothermal energy was one of the reasons why. Geothermal they... energy. Yeah, geothermal energy, definitely. So uh, there's been quite a lot of work done recently on Aluto to see if they can. Um, reconfigure the power plant there and get it up and running again. Um, and and uh, there was um, some seismic work done alongside that to try to assess the the, the risk that's going on. Uh, there's exploration at Tulumoye. I didn't mention this, but in fact, we had a couple of sites from uh, from there. So um, they they kindly allowed us to use um, a couple of Reykjavik, so this is Reykjavik Geothermal, a couple of their sites um, in, in the inversion. And then they've also uh, done a lot of work and I believe are now building a plant or doing very late stage of um, investigation uh, down at Corvetti Volcano further south. For, again, for that's Reykjavik Geothermal. So, uh, and then there was some work also in the um, Tenderhoe region further north, just on the edge of Afar as well, but I don't think there's anything actively going on there. So the three main areas that I'm aware of where work is going on or planned is Tulumoye, Alutu, and then Corbeto further south, would be one of these down here. 